the up Ephesians, uh, we're in the chapter six. So it is my intention to get you through chapter six today. We won't be able to cover everything, but we'll do enough uh, deep diving that we'll get into a lot of stuff. So uh, let's begin with a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that your ways are true and that your word is all powerful, eternally so, and for this day and for our lives. We thank you uh, for the Apostle Paul and the other apostles and prophets through whom your spirit is written, that we would be uh, truly people of your word and the people who love your word and who grow in your word, who are strengthened and sustained by your word and bless us in this hour together of Christian fellowship and study. In your saving name we pray, amen. All right, so the study guide is just gonna give you just, just bits and pieces so uh, there's not a whole lot of room for note taking some of you are prolific note takers, and uh, so there's not enough room for you. Uh, for those of you who don't take any notes at all, there's plenty of room on this page for you, right? And for those of you who can't, you know, who can't read your own writing, um, just write down a lot and act like you're learning something. So uh, I think what I'm gonna do is read myself, read it out myself since I'm on mic, and uh, that, that way we can all hear it. Uh, I'm gonna take you through uh, 1 verse 9 to start with. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, uh, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but the, like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. All right, so those are the verses that we're gonna study first of all. And if you just go to the note that I had, the, the half sheet I have, uh, here we are taught some things about the themes of vocation, stations in life and contentment. And when you're talking about the ways of God in the hearts and lives of his people, uh, this would be one of the ways or the areas in which our human nature rebels. And, and says, I'm not content. I want something different, better. We're not talking about uh, s sincerely looking for the best way to serve God, but we're talking about being content in whatever situation you find yourself, trusting God to change it as he would or as he needs to, but otherwise serve God where you are. That's, a, that's really one of the overarching themes here. Serve God where you are. Even if where you are is not the most easy setting or situation, serve God there. We're gonna talk about contentment, we're gonna build on that. We're gonna take a look at some other verses too. So note that verses one through nine are essentially a continuation of the themes of chapter five. And you studied that last week, the whole, the whole marriage and the whole mystery of husband and wife and some of the words there are so contrary to the world's definition, of, uh, poor definition of marriage but the word of God is there for us, husband, wives, and then it flows into the home, flows into relationships. So uh, re remember that when scripture was written, it was just the whole letter to the Ephesians. There were no chapter and verse divisions. That was added later by scribes and scholars and others. So uh, you can make a real easy case that chapter five doesn't finish up till verse nine. We're not gonna debate that because it finally isn't important. It's still scripture, the word of God for us, all right? as well as dealing with the uh, teaching of, of marriage, family, and authority. So, commandments four and six are being promoted and taught here, not so much as what not to do, but how to fulfill the goodness of this portion of God's holy word. So for those of you who remember Luther's small catechism, when you went through eighth grade and did all that memorization, and most of us did, not all of us, most of us did, Luther, one of Luther's parts of brilliance, and, and he really was a brilliant man, not without flaws, but he was a brilliant man. He framed the meaning of the commandments with what we shall not do, but with what we shall do. So it was an encouragement to godly living. Uh, don't, don't, uh, well, 
the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother that it may be well with you, you live long in the earth. We should fear and love God that we may uh, obey masters, right? Obey them. So not only to, to not be against them, but to do what is right in keeping with that. So you got the commandments that are here, chapters four and six. All right, so uh, right before Hebrews comes a one chapter letter to Philemon. Let's take a look at that. That's gonna be one of our important cross references today. Philemon is right before Hebrews. It's the only book of the New Testament with one chapter only. We have reason to believe that as Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesian believers, he also wrote to Philemon, an individual. So it says he sent, um, I said mailman, but as he sent messengers around in the area, the same messenger likely brought this to Philemon and the Ephesian believers. So they are intertwined. Philemon is spoken very specific and directly. I'm gonna read verse nine. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains, namely in prison. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me, so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, meaning in the gospel, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. It seems like Paul, through his missionary journeys, was one who brought Philemon to faith. Now, these two men of faith are needing to reach a God-pleasing agreement about this young man, Onesimus, who was a runaway slave. This is serious stuff in the Roman Empire. I'm gonna read, continue. Uh, 19, uh, 20. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. All right, I could go on and on about the letter to Philemon because it is rich in forgiveness and mercy and trust and renewal and recovery in all of this. Onesimus was a runaway slave, made it to Rome. Somehow he knew about Paul, was there with Paul's Roman uh, imprisonment, which was a kind of house arrest. Paul could receive guests. And there, apparently, Onesimus became himself a man of faith in Christ. Now there's a problem, because men and women, followers of Christ, will obey authorities. Onesimus was a runaway slave, punishable if prosecuted by death, if prosecuted. Paul and Onesimus surely had some times together talking about this, and Paul said, Onesimus, you got to go back. I, the risk of faith with these men, these three men, is dramatic to me because Paul had to say you got to go back I love having you here you're such a blessing to me you got to go back Onesimus a runaway slave now in Christ realized I got to go back I got to obey and Philemon a man of faith had to receive him back without prosecuting either at the level of death or something lesser but Paul said don't do it I'm trusting you. And I mean, Paul's in prison. He can only trust Philemon to take care of Onesimus. The drama of these men in faith 
it, it, it always gets me. I said, wow, what would that be like? Would you have, if you were any one of the three, what would you have done? And so when Paul writes to the Ephesians, at the same time he wrote to Philemon, he's talking about slaves and masters. You be good to each other. Be good to each other. Treat each other well in the name of Christ. Now, how does that relate to us today? I think employer and employee relate to each other well for the sake of Christ. Don't be demeaning. Be uplifting. Be gracious and generous. Be kind with your words of prayer. All of that. So, rather than get into the to topic of slavery, uh, because in, in the Civil War years, even before that, you had ardent Christians on both sides of that debate. You know that, don't you? You, you did study history in, in school. And how do you make sense of that? When one group of Christians said slavery is supported in scripture, is it? And others said, it is not right to own a man or woman or child. It is not right, but they are free in Christ. So they had to maneuver that in their years we got to maneuver through other things in our years. All right, so Philemon is one place. I also want to take you to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17. I think that helps a little bit too. Uh, Acts, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. <clears throat> and uh, 17 through 24. And there's a lot going on here as far as divorce and marriage and the unbeliever leaving all that. <clears throat> Pardon me. Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule I laid down in all the churches. Was the man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. I don't know what that surgery is like. Uh, was the man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although, if you can gain your freedom, do so. For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freedman. In other words, if you're a slave and you belong to Christ, you're free. But you still have a position in life. Right? Your position in life may be one because of whatever situation... Let, let's, just, let's just use an illustration. Uh, a young person uh, in the middle of college has both parents killed suddenly and realizes that out of duty, he or she will forsake college for a time and take care of the little kids at home yet until they're grown. Let's say that's 12 years. And that person is doing what's right and yet surely sometimes struggles. I could be out of college by now. I could be in law school, med school. I could be doing this, I could be doing that. But no, I gotta take care of these little kids. You could have that attitude or you could say, this is my position thrust upon me by a situation that no one asked for and I'm gonna do what's right. That's just one example. Uh, but, but Paul says, serve God where you are. All right, now, one text I didn't write down here is uh, Genesis. So let's go back to Genesis uh, 39, first book of the Bible, of course. And we're going to take a look there. I gotta, hang on, hang on, hang on. I think I want the very first half of that. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned from the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. And then you can read the rest, and he got in trouble because of 
um, uh, Potiphar's wife and she tried to seduce him. Joseph said, not in your life, or words of that effect, and she lied, and then he was thrown in prison. Verse 20. Joseph's master, Potiphar, uh, took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success at whatever he did. All right, I'm just showing you these verses because I believe in the principle, Scripture interprets Scripture. That's a, that's a Lutheran, uh, not theory, it's a thematic way of looking into the Word of God. Scripture interprets Scripture, and a lot of the times we can go to other places in Scripture for illustrations, for examples. And so uh, if, if you wrote down Genesis 39, I think that would do you well in understanding Ephesians chapter 6. Now, let's talk about uh, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. What is the promise? In Ephesians, it looks like if you obey your parents, you'll live a long life. But he's quoting what? He's quoting the giving of the law, which is where? Exodus 20. So, and I don't think I wrote that down, did I? All right, so write that down also. Aaron, Aaron Hedlund, God bless him, cleaned the whiteboard for me. I said, okay, I'll use it at least once. So, Exodus 20. There, that'll make him happy. So let's turn to Exodus 20, please. Genesis, Exodus. <clears throat> All right, what have we had so far? We've had uh, the people of God uh, in slavery in Egypt for 430 years. God sent them Moses. Moses brought them out. You have all the, the, uh, the miracles and the plagues and all that. And then uh, they're going where to the promised land. Uh, then they hesitate, they doubt God, and God says, well, you know, you're doubting me, it's gonna be 40 years. All that is in Genesis and Exodus. Well, Exodus primarily, but you got it here, okay? Then you get to the giving of the law once they're on the way to the promised land. Verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of your fathers, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. That will help you watch the news and know history. Verse 12. Honor your father and your mother so that you, plural, may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. It is a promise to them as a nation. It is not a promise to the individual. It is a promise to the nation. Honor your father and mother. I'm going to tell you how important that commandment is. Based on this, you're going to have a prosperous and long standing life for generation upon generations in the land which I've given you. Okay, that's been broken millions of times. But when we get to Ephesians chapter six, and we read that, you'll live a long life. We say, well, that means if a kid dies at 11, he must have been naughty his whole, he must have, maybe God's punishing him. No, the promise is not for the individual. The promise is for God's people as a nation that we will live long. The kingdom of God expands. The kingdom of God is still here. The kingdom of God will survive against all the threats of Satan. That's the ending part of Ephesians chapter 6. Does that make sense to you? So if we read Ephesians 6, the first few verses, and say, well, if I obey my mom and dad, I better do it, because I, I, I want to live a long life. I want to live to be old. Some of you are older than me. Not many, but some. Right? Yeah, okay. But how do you explain early death? How do you explain the long life of an evil person? You don't explain it by not understanding Exodus 20. That's how you don't do it. That's how you do it. 
So uh, one of the things that was riveting for me as a child is that there was a boy, uh, his name was Gary. He lived a block and a half away. One morning he didn't wake up. He'd had a couple years before a, 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 a major, major um, brain accident. They thought he was okay, but there was something growing in there and exploded and he died. That shakes up a little kid in your neighborhood. He what? He went to bed and didn't wake up? I went to bed last night and I woke up. So you begin processing that and you process it on our limitations of making sense of that. Boy, either it caused me to fear or to be boastful. I didn't die because I obeyed my mom and dad. Yeah, okay. Those stories are hidden, by the way to most, right? But it's the Exodus 20 that gives us the, not the movement, but, but the context in which that was given. I'm giving you your own land where you will live in my name for all time. This commandment is tied into how long you'll live there. And God was serious about that. So when Paul says, obey your father and mother, he's simply saying, this is important. Remember Exodus 20? That's all he's asking us to do in Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm not saying that in a minim minimalistic way. He's just calling us back to Exodus chapter 20. All right, back to Ephesians chapter 6. All right, we got slaves, we got masters. Uh, we don't have that today, but we have employees, employers. We got husbands and wives, we got children, all of that. So it is keeping with how we live out our lives. Now, we're going to get into the battle. Satan. Ten. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With, it, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare fearlessly as I should. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. All right. So we're not going to get to the last few verses. We're not going to have time for that. And it's not unimportant, it's just, it's not the theme of Ephesians 6, it's the, the body, right? Did you notice, if I were to give you a quiz, and I probably should sometime, I mean for credit. I would ask you, what two things are we to be doing in those verses? And you would, and I want to say this as nicely as I can without disrespecting the word of God, you'd focus on all the things of armor and all that. And that's there. We're going to talk about what that really means. 
and, and how we really have that already. It's called Jesus. But we're to stand and pray. Did you count how many times I read the word stand? Well, you don't think about that with a warrior in battle. You think of a warrior in battle as strategizing, as attacking, as all of that. And Paul says, put on the, put on the armor. We're going to talk about that. Put on the armor, but I want you to stand. Immovable. And we are immovable in Christ. Oh, and then pray. Those are the two things here. All right. The backside of your guide of, of your study guide is for us. Would you read with me the uh, morning prayer by your friend, Dr. Martin Luther? I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Uh, we all know that prayer. We all know it. And from my perspective, one of the many emotional things that happened in my life, and I really get emotional about a lot of stuff. Anyway, um, when I hear the kids in our school pray that prayer, every Thursday morning in chapel, they got it memorized. They got it down. I thought, what generation is this? 20? 25? I mean, how many generations have known that prayer and have prayed it so naturally uh, powerfully, regularly, and of course there's an evening prayer that matches that, they're both in the hymnal, but the evil foe, that's all part of that, and Luther was very aware of this. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me, and we pray that every day, because we do desire that we have power over the evil one, which of course, as Pastor Echocamp said in the sermon today, we do. That was... Uh, you know, when I found out he was preaching on Ephesians 6, I had a check with him. I said, don't, don't you steal my stuff. <laughs> I said, don't you steal my stuff. And from the litany. Now, we don't often do the litany, but on, during the Lent and Advent seasons, I'll, I'll often choose one of the forms of prayer because I think they're so rich down through history. Uh, and I'm going to read this to you, and then I'm going to defend myself a little bit. In the middle of the litany, we pray this that the Lord would put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the world truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet. I love that phrase, to beat down Satan under our feet. Yeah, grind him up, to send faithful laborers into your harvest. I have family members who just cringe when I say erred. Uh, they said it should be erred. But I grew up with uh, teachers who were very well trained, and they, they said erred, so I still say erred. And we, uh, we battled over this, and I looked it up online. And erred is a historic pronunciation, but no longer popular. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> no longer popular. It's okay, I was right, but I was wrong. All right, but, and then uh, one of my favorite hymns, <laughs> Um, stanza three, Satan, I defy thee. We sing that. And just, we just stand there, Satan, I, just, Satan, I defy thee. Death, I now decry thee. Fear, I bid thee cease. Lord, thou shalt not harm me, nor thy threats alarm me, while I sing of peace. God's great power guards every hour. Earth and all its depths adore him, silent bow. Before him. Love that hymn. Josef Frank, who was at least 15 generations before us. That man could write hymns. All right. So, back to the first aside. We have the teaching of the armor of God. I'm telling you, you already have the, the, the belt, the shield, the sword, the helmet. You have it. It's called life in Christ. 
But Paul says, be strong in that. Stand firm, pray. Speaking of armor, would you go with me back to 1 Samuel 17? Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel. Verse 32, David, the shepherd boy, said of Saul, the king who is over his head in duties. I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 17, verse 32. I'm sorry, pardon me. Verse 32. Oops. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine, meaning Goliath. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him? You're only a boy. And he has been a fighting man from his youth. Scholars put David about 16 or 17 at this time. But David said to Saul, listen, I added that word. Your servant had been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. That's faith in the living God. That's David's armor. Would you agree with me? Yes. That's David's armor. Saul said to David, all right, I added that word. Go and the Lord be with you. Now, I don't know if Saul's overly confident, but nobody else is going to fight the Philistine. None of his mighty men. No, we're not going out. David said, I'll take him. This is, well, we know this story, this narrative. 38. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took a staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with a shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome. Ruddy probably means redheaded, but let's not get lost in that one. And he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog? You come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his God, small g. Come here, he said and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. It's true, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. All right, so you could go on either before that or after that. It's all scintillating in things of faith. But the connection is the armor is what we already have been given, which is what David had. David said, I don't need worldly armor. I've got God. I've got the truth of God. I've got the power of the only true eternal God. I'm good. That's how we live. I'm good. We don't need worldly armor, that which we add to goodness or prestige or fame or accomplishments. That's not armor. That's nothing. We think it is. We think, well, I'm, I'm strong against Satan because I got all these things. No, you're not. You're strong against Satan because of who you already have, Christ dwelling in you. Michael, Pastor Michael quoted, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. That's in 1 John um, chapter 5, I believe. It's 4 or 5. I don't have that written down. So all of that is there for us to consider the armor. All right, now. All right. I've got some things for us to look at. Uh, Matthew 6, 13. 
Matthew 6.13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Why am I bringing that up? Because Jesus, early on in his ministry, identifies that is our daily prayer. We pray it in English against evil, delivers from evil. Jesus said the evil one, that lying bastard Satan, using the words of Jay Brinkmeyer, who spent three years in Haiti. So there are no children present, so I can, I can say that. That lying bastard Satan, that's what Jay Brinkmeyer calls him. Okay? Jesus said, deliver me. All right, so we have that taught by Jesus himself. Uh, I'm going to write down another thing, just, uh, and this is only, we may not get to it. I, I want to show you uh, Song of Solomon. Verses 5 to 7, Solomon. Don't turn there now, but in case I don't, you may want to turn there later. Because uh, in, uh, in Song of Solomon 5 through 7, you have the lover and the beloved speaking words of effusive praise to the beauty, the goodness of the other. And it's almost rated R in a beautiful way, husband to wife, wife to husband, until you begin looking at the metaphor or the pictures that they're using is say, you have breasts like swans? I don't know if that's attractive or not. The, the point, and you can look it up later. We may have time, we may not. But the point is, we're using metaphors here. We are not walking around burdened by, gotta have this armor, do I have my belt? Yes, you've got your belt of truth. You got Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. I've got that verse in there for us. You already have the armor of God. So when we uh, sometimes make the mistake, we say, well, do I have my helmet on? Yes. And he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We've already been prepared to live our lives against the evil one so that we don't panic and attack and stand firm. You know why? Because our enemy is not flesh and blood. We need to talk about that too. You're like me, and you are. I often am fooled into thinking that the enemies are the people who are badly caught up in the lies of Satan, and they are. They're not the enemy. We would rather have them be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth and repent of their ways. That's what we'd rather have, right, boys and girls? Because sometimes we don't want that. Well, I'd rather have them just damned right now. But God desires the death of no one. But all should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So when we confuse that, we are already a little bit skewed in our armor. We have an attitude of attacking. I wish that person would. Okay. We really wish that person would do is be brought to repentance. Saving faith. Right? Yeah, right. Okay. And, and so all of this is there for our consideration. We don't have time to go to Acts chapter 9. But one of the most chilling verses in Scripture, in a good way, is when Saul had been blinded by God, brought to a method, a, a time of repentance, and now is being visited by Ananias, servant of God, give him sight, and back. I mean, that's out of this world expectation of a man. Because Paul had come, Saul, Paul, same name, had come to Damascus to kill us, people like you and me. Ananias. Ananias went to the upper room and said what? Brother Saul. That's chilling to me. <laughs> could you do that? Could you, you? You could. When you stand firm in Christ. You're not attacking, you're not despising, you're not slashing, you're standing firm. 
I got Jesus. And praying, those two things. Standing with all the armor that we have in Christ and praying. All right, I'm getting preachy. Uh, tables number one, two, and three. That's you. Second Corinthians 11, verse 14. Back to tables. John 1. You know, what do I want in John 1? Uh, truth, light of Jesus, all right? These three, right here. John 8. You'll find it. These three. What do I have next? John 14. You'll find it. And those three tables, 1 Peter 5. And uh, we'll do Genesis 3 and Matthew 16 together later. So I'm going to give you about two or three minutes to find the text. I'm, I'm, I gave one of you the verses. The others, I just gave the chapters. So scout it out, figure it out as far as the truth of Jesus and the reality of the demonic and what we need to learn from that. And if you can't figure it out, I'll tell you. All right, I know you're not quite done, but we gotta keep going. Uh, let's, uh, would one of you who has 2 Corinthians 11, 14, read it loudly and clearly, please. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Okay, one more verse, Dean, I should have said, yeah. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose ends will be according all right, so you may not have ever heard that, but, but uh, Paul says it's no wonder that there's such deception because Satan can even masquerade as an angel of light. So how do you fight that? By standing firm, by standing and praying. You don't have to be uh, caught up in all of the innuendos or theories or themes that would otherwise dismay you. All right, let me give you an example, if I could, please. Early in my pastoral career, as I studied other religions, I was convinced that Joseph Smith, the founder of the Latter-day Saints Church, was nothing but a shyster, and he was. Uh, history is clear. He was a thief, and he was a grand adulterer, and even uh, with um, ladies who were girls under uh, 12 and 13. And he claimed that he received a vision from the angel Moroni, and that was the Book of Mormon, which is a bizarre book if you read any of it. It's just bizarre. And um, in it, there are no names of cities or people that are found anywhere else in literature of history, as opposed to the Bible, which even today can account for 98% of all the locations mentioned that are accurate. I began to realize he probably was visited by the angel Moroni in the upper hills of New York State. 
you probably, I thought, no, you just made that up. I thought, no, you can't last that long on man's lies, but something can last that long on the lies of Satan. The same thing is true of the uh, founder of the, the Muslim religion, um, um, yes, who in about 60, 620 uh, AD uh, in the city of Medina uh, received a vision. And he was also an adulterer and, and a power hungry man. But the truth of it is that they probably were visited by an angel of light slash Satan. Each of them is built on lies and violence. Now, you would say, well, the Old Testament is violence. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's read Jesus, shall we? Let's read Jesus, shall we? Let's read Jesus, shall we? Which they won't do. They'll say, no, no, we'll, we'll reinterpret Jesus. And so you've got false religions with all sorts of power over people built on lie and violence. That's the world. Now, if we're not firm in our armor, we're going to be all jumbled and misled about that and see them as either intriguing or awful, but they're all caught up in a lie. They're all caught up in a lie. And what do we have here? For those of you who like to read, I know all of you can read, but not everybody likes to read. Um, a couple of interesting books that you may want to look at, uh, of all people, Zane Gray, and you think, well, is that Western? Yeah, Zane Gray, Riders of the Purple Sage. Kurt, you're nodding your head, right? Incredible book, Riders of the Purple Sage. Got to read it. The other one is by your friend Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who is Sherlock Holmes. One of the earliest Sherlock Holmes mysteries has to do with Mormon violence in the early days of their years and how it found its way through families and into England and he solved the case. It's called The Scarlet Thread by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. We've read both of those for Christian Music Group over the years. And then we've got some with, with people coming to faith out of Islam and out of uh, Mormon. Uh, there is a book by a woman named Lynn K. Wilder. It's called Unveiling Grace. And uh, she and her husband uh, became Mormon. And she was one of the only women professors in Brigham Young. And they touted her as just, just how wonderful they were. Uh, so if you said they were male dominated, you could point to Lynn K. Wilder. And one of her sons uh, went away for his two year required mission trip and he went to Florida. And he uh, fell in love with a Christian girl who was troubled by his attitude and said, let's just read Jesus for a year. Let's just read the gospels for a year. And it transformed not only that young man to come to faith in Christ, but the whole family. So then she became an outcast. It's a good book, Unveiling Grace by Lynn K. Wilder. Uh, so I don't want to dwell on that, but 2 Corinthians 11, uh, Satan can masquerade as an angel of light. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to be mindful because I've already got the armor of God. I got the belt of truth, the feet of peace. I got Isaiah in there someplace, I think. I don't have Isaiah in there. Oh, I don't have Isaiah in there. Uh, Isaiah 52, verse 7, I think it is. Wait, let me write it on the board. Do I have it in here? Now I'm all upset. Isaiah 52, verse 7, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. All right, so this will make Aaron really happy. Isaiah 52, verse 7. Yes, Romans 10 is where Paul, yes, thank you, about the, uh, the uh, how beautiful are the feet. Yes, thank you, Roger. All right, so what did we find in John 1? Who's my John 1 tables? All right, what did you find out? I guess.
Yes, early on is John 1 verse 5, the darkness cannot overcome the light, yes? I think I'm looking at verse 17 or 18, right? 16, 17, 18? Full of grace and truth. Thank you. Laura, can you read it? Thank you, Laura. Full of grace and truth. This is Christ incarnate, all time Lord, God forever. All right, so that's the purpose of John 1. And John 8, what did we discover there? Christ is the light of the world. And the situation there was with people who opposed him, right? He also said something about the devil in John 8. You are your father, the devil. You and? Are of your father. Keep reading. Oh, I'm just, you're heading there, I think. Oh. Because, but because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? I tell you the truth. Why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the word of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Yeah, you are of your father, the devil. He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Right, so that's why John 8 is important. Uh, John 14. Anybody have a few verses there that are helpful for this? Margie. Yeah, but he's defeated. Thank you. He's defeated. I'm looking at the verse in chapter 14 where Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. So that the, the word truth there is what connects us to the armor of God, the truth. Truth, peace. Those are words that are found in with the helmet. All right. Uh, let's see. First uh, Peter 5. Thank you, Dallas. Resist him. Don't attack, just resist. You got Jesus, right? There's that, we're strong in Christ. That's what we are. All of these verses are, are showing that. All right, let's turn to, um, well, you know Genesis 3 and, and how Satan lied uh, to Eve and then Adam, and you know that whole thing, and how God immediately promised that Satan would be crushed. All right, let's go to Matthew 16 together, shall we? Yes, we shall. Matthew 16. I think I'm actually preaching on this text next Sunday. I think. I'll let you know Sunday, all right? <laughs> but it's, it's one of my texts in the next four or five weeks, I, but I think it's is coming Sunday. All right, so uh, I'm going to begin at verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, meaning his faith, not Peter, the faith, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Okay? We're standing firm. The gates of hell, that's the force that attacks. We don't attack. We stand firm and resolute and confident in Christ, who has already defeated the enemy. I give, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Of course, that, te that theme is repeated elsewhere. That's the opposite of the keys. Don't have time for that now. But the, the, the visual here is that the strength we have of our place in Christ, our saving faith, we don't have to be attacking because we'd be hurting people who are not the enemy. And the one who is the enemy is defeated. So we're not contending against flesh and blood. Boy, we think we are. 
we're not contending against them. We'd rather have them be saved. We'd rather love them if we could. We'd rather feed them when they're hungry. We'd rather have conversations with them when they're able. They're not our enemy. Satan is. Now I'm no, don't be afraid of Satan. He's defeated. Right? We have that, the certainty of Christ. So those are the things that I think we have. And finally, the one verse I don't have for you here is Hebrews chapter 4. I do not know why I don't write down Hebrews chapter 4. It's right after Philemon. Come on, people, that was funny. <laughs> yes, Roger. Yes. Yeah, we're going to read that in just a little bit, yes. But the sword is still not necessarily for attack. It's also for defense. And uh, I, I think the fact that the word stand is used five times there, I mean, that's a lot of uses in about, what, four or five verses? Stand, 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 stand. It's just a, it's a confidence builder to me. We're, we're good. We're covered. We're prepared. We're his. So... Hebrews chapter 4. Now I lost it. Yeah, it's right after Philemon. 12. For, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Well, wait a minute. That would not only be my heart, but maybe the heart of those that I consider enemies that the word of God can pierce into their heart as well, which would be Christ-pleasing, wouldn't it? He died for all. All right. Questions, comments, cutting remarks? That's the quote one of my early professors. Yes, Gordon. Um, back to uh, Peter and uh, uh, Matthew 16. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so uh, he's, he's praised, I guess, that, you know, that he knows. The truth. Yeah, so the faith that Peter had was not by himself. Right. It was not by man. It was by God. Because I remember right, a few verses after that, he's, Peter's being chastised. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Yes. He didn't say, get behind me, Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. Correct. So again, it's just principality. Well said. <laughs> right, just a few verses later, uh, Peter is, is misunderstanding something, and Jesus said, that's a Satan. Right. So, Roseanne, I'll qu quote with you, but I've got to tell you a cute story. And if you've heard this, tell me like this. I've heard it four times already. Yeah. <laughs> the older you get, you'll find people saying, I've heard this before. Anyway, so <laughs> am I not telling you the truth? All right, okay. So the first year I was here, 1997, we were just beginning to print the worship folder. I thought that was an important way to go. And we were about uh, 10 minutes from printing for the Sunday service. And I had Bob Ewell proofread it. And we were quoting uh, Isaiah, uh, Matthew 16 with the quote you did, get behind me, Satan. And it was going to print, get behind me, Stan. <laughs> and, and Bob said, yeah, I don't think you want to do that. I think you might want to change that one. Get behind me, Stan, yeah. Try that one. Get behind me, Stan. Roseanne, finish up. Which has been one. I would say you're not disagreeing with me, and I'm not disagreeing with you, but we're not attacking the people. But we are attacking Be because the evil people. Uh, but, uh, we're, we're speaking truth, but we're not hoping to hurt them. We're, we're hoping to bring about a changed heart. 
a change policy, a change philosophy, whatever. So I don't think standing firm means we do nothing. I, I think standing firm is I'm not going to attack. As God leads me in the situations, that's where I'll love and, and speak truth. But keeping in mind that my, our battle is not against flesh and blood. And I think we are really confused about that. I am. Because sometimes I can get livid with people. This is an awful person. Well, Satan. Now, this morning, the gospel reading, Pastor Michael didn't develop the sermon because he was in Ephesians. But in the synagogue, it was Mark, wasn't it, today? Mark? The man jumped up by, uh, with a demon. And he was a part of their synagogue. So he'd been there that whole time. And only when in the, in the presence of Jesus did it, did it just cause the, the, uh, the demon to jump up and be known. Otherwise, he was not known by those. And so that's why the truth of God, and some of you have verses of truth, the truth of God spoken, uh, John 1, the, the evil cannot overcome it, nor will it, nor will it uh, um, understand it. But, but the truth will reveal all that is evil in, in God's timing. So I would say we're not disagreeing, but we don't go after people as the enemy. We say, I'll, I'm going to speak the truth here. It's my belt, and I know I'm protected. Now, they may attack you and hate you and cast you out, but you're not harmed because you're still Christ. Gene, then we're done. But you won't be attacking. Right. But you won't be attacking. But I won't be attacking. No, you won't be attacking. I'm not doing anything. I'm not saying that I would do anything. I would lose anything. Like this. Yeah. You would speak the truth. Standing firm. I, I like the word standing firm. Yeah, I probably was misunderstood with the standing firm. I, what I mean is we're not attacking. Right. And, and uh, you know, th that, that's why the references to war... Uh, in some hymnody over the years is, in my mind, a little bit misplaced because the war is against us. But it's been won by Christ. So we can talk with confidence. Oh, have no fear, little flock. Right? Oh, little flock, fear not the foe. Those are some of our hymns. Um, because we, we live in a world to make a difference. And our presence does make a difference. Just like Joseph in Genesis 39. His presence, a man of faith, made a difference. Uh, because Joseph served God faithfully. So I would not say that we're not to speak the truth. We certainly are, but not in an attacking mode or in a spiteful mode or hate-filled. And I think that's our temptation. It is for me. But we can still give certain people over to God and say, God, deal with them. Because if I do, it's going to mess both of us up. So, yeah, I got yeah, to quit. Hey, Gil, I got to quit. One more thing. If they're late for 11 o'clock church, it's on you. Go ahead. You know what? Pastor Echo Kemp, the, 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 the word wrestle, um, I didn't really do too much with that word, um, but I, 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 I forgot to tell you that, that in that section, uh, the word tyrant is used in the, in the original Greek, and the schemes of the devil is actually expert methods of the devil. You know, this is what I prepared today. So, um, yeah, I just, in my study, I couldn't get away from the word stand five times.
Five times it's used there. But okay, that's where I went. A lot of you have a lot more words to say to me right now, I can tell. I can just tell, I can just tell. But we gotta quit. We, got, we have to quit. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the way, the truth, and the life, and we have been made yours forever, so that in this world we are called to be living in freedom, in peace, in truth, and making a difference, not hating nor attacking, but loving, speaking, serving, and all of it to your glory. We pray it in your name. Amen. Whew. That was a tough one. You like that?